start. I know it's been a bit of traffic. The parking is a little bit um, weird. A trees across the road and last time it was a snowstorm, so I should be grateful that that's all that's happening today, right? My name is Lori Nicholson. I'm with Bark to be Heard. Um, I have been after a solution. Hi, Alan. Alan's on Skype right now over in University of Liverpool. Um, I've been after this for 13 years when my dog got a antimicrobial resistant infection and all the veterinary practices and the veterinarians who tried to go after this infectious disease um, were siloed. And I, a lot of them had never dealt with anything like this before. So push come to shove, I ended up driving to the University of Georgia where I met a specialist who this is all he dealt with. And the first thing the guy said to me was, damn, I wish I had seen him six months ago. And I thought to myself, wow. Wow. And first of all, driving to Georgia, and like, how come nobody's connected? And how come, you know, why in the age of communication technology am I driving like 600 miles anywhere? It doesn't make any sense. Why, why is everything siloed? So that's what got me on this path for Bark to be heard. And this was the dog, and this is what happened. And so I'm still doing this in his memory because I promised him that what happened to him wouldn't be in vain and that we, we could do a better job. And I know we can. So we have some fabulous speakers tonight. Um, the first thing I wanted to mention is I've done pet expos all over the country. And I've asked pet owners, what do you think about a network? A surveillance network where the data, your everyday medical records that your pet gets, you give permission, consent, and they are put into a system where researchers can actually start to see trends instead of being siloed and just sitting there doing nothing, this information can just be free to flow and researchers can start to see things as they're happening or even get ahead of things before they're happening. And um, the results of that survey it, all across the country were quite shocking. I thought some people would be ambivalent, but the truth of the matter is, is that not one pet owner after hundreds and hundreds and hundreds from here to Austin, to California, to Massachusetts said no thought this was a bad idea. In fact, most were incredulous, like, are you, we don't have this? There's no data surveillance network for companion animals? I said, no, there isn't. And so this is where we are now. And I brought my board member, Ken, with me, because Ken was at the last pet expo here in Hartford, and he was there surveying people. So I want you to hear from the horse's mouth, so to speak, um, <laughs> just so you don't think I'm making it up. But he saw for himself the, not the demand, but the support the overwhelming support for doing this, you know, doing something really wonderful for our pets and health outcomes. So Ken, could you just tell them what you saw? Sure, I'd be happy to. Uh, when Lori first explained this to me, what the mission she was on, I understood it with um, how it related to my situation with uh, my dog, my adopted dog named Jersey Girl. We lost her about three years ago, and the story resonated because this, this program that you're building would have helped save my Jersey Girl at the time. And so I wanted to do what I can to try and help Lori bring this to fruition. When we were working at the Pet Expo up in uh, Hartford, every person we asked the questions to, everyone said, you mean it's not in place now? And people really were engaged with the mission, the purpose, and everyone said, yes, we'll support this, we'll sign our name, and we'll be happy to participate any way we can because we feel it's very important for their pet and all pet owners. It was a wonderful success in market research. And that being said, um, so pet owners are an untapped asset because we are the direct beneficiaries of better health outcomes, right? We're doing this for our pets. And for dogs like Blue, who's here today, a service ECAD dog, which is an educated canine assisting disabilities dog. So not just for our wonderful companion animals, but what about all the service dogs out there that help people on a daily basis? We do this for them too. We connect the dots. And for the first time, we get a look at the big picture. So that's, that's the goal. I'd like to introduce Peter Alberti. He's with the Association for Veterinary Informatics. So for those of you who wonder what informatics is all about, Peter is uh, quite knowledgeable. So with that, please come on up, Peter. Sure, thanks. Hi, Alan. <laughs> so thanks very much for coming out tonight. Um, glad you're here. I'm glad we're all here. Um, I thought I was going to be the shortest presentation, but after having some discussions ahead of this and listening to, to what you had to say, maybe, maybe not. <coughs> um, so, uh, so my name is Peter Alberti. I am the outreach chair for the Association of Veterinary Informatics. 
Um, and I do want to talk uh, a bit about AVI and, and what we do and how we do it. You'll notice it doesn't say AVI on here because I'm also um, the CEO of Inulogica, which is a company that supports uh, veterinarians in, in their efforts to get pet owners to say yes more often uh, during their appointments um, through data. So <clears throat> if you'll indulge me a moment or two, um, it might help to understand why I'm here um, because I don't have a lot of letters after my name, so, uh, but, but hopefully I can add some value. So my background actually is, uh, I have a business degree and my background is, is in startups and small business. Um, and I also have my time with the IBM Watson Group. So I've got a pretty diverse career that, that extends uh, in technology and data, uh, but also in, in, in small business in particular. And small business is one of my favorite things on the planet to talk about. Um, in 2012, I was doing a small business and uh, an idea fell into my lap because entrepreneurs get these ideas and then go off on them. Um, the idea was to create a charity to help pet owners raise money for veterinary care when they couldn't afford it. And this idea fell into my lap from a radio show that I heard where people were telling the, the host and the veterinarian, I can't afford my pet care. And I said, well, go raise money. And um, so I built a charity around online crowdfunding for, for veterinary care. It was fun. Um, what I learned from that experience, though, was a lot about the veterinary small business and the transformation that's been going on for some time now that has uh, accelerated rapidly in the last few years uh, in how the industry has changed and changing. Um, and I also learned a lot about what pet owners were saying about their veterinarians oftentimes behind their backs. And I said, well, there's a gap here that we can help to support uh, and, and close and get pet owners to have better conversations with their doctors and, and their veterinary team. So why is that relevant? Well, it's pr primarily because I want you to understand where I'm coming from here. Um, I saw an industry that, coming from software and IT mostly in my career, this is a group of people that is, you know, some of the most wonderful, kind-hearted, excellent people in the world, and I really wanted to help. And I'm so glad I did because of what you do. Um, however, what I also identified, and this isn't news, is that, um, there's not a lot of desire to understand the business and marketing side of things in the veterinary profession. And so by leveraging all of my experience and the data work that I've done, especially with IBM Watson, um, looking to use data to help create influence. And that brought me to AVI, the Association of Veterinary Informatics, which uh, then caused me to learn a lot about how data is being used in, in many different ways. So that's a little about my background, maybe a little long, but I did want you to understand why I'm here and how I hope to help. So that'll come into play. So the discussion here is what is informatics? Uh, this agenda is not terribly long on purpose. Um, I'm mainly here to try to hopefully introduce you to the notions if you don't already understand them. Um, but I'm here for very similar reasons as Laurie and everybody else, which is to encourage um, everybody to participate in some way in informatics and the work with data. Um, at, and there's a bunch of different ways in which you can do that at a number of different levels. So that's what I want to hopefully articulate here and get you to uh, uh, be a part of that. Um, so what are the opportunities to leverage informatics within the veterinary industry? Uh, what obstacles and challenges exist? And that'll probably be the primary point of my discussion and what resources are available. Um, so starting off with what is informatics, uh, there's a big difference between analytics and informatics. Analytics is very much, um, is something statistically relevant? You know, what are the data sets and so forth? Informatics is, is the collection, storage, and practical use of data with a purpose. Uh, that's a, a, a broad definition. There's no official definition for what informatics is, but it's been around forever, right? So it's been in use since the 50s in human health um, and certainly for at least 30 years in, in animal health and veterinary uh, health, um, veterinary care, uh, mostly in academic and research environments uh, up until recently, but we've started to see the rest of the industries start to come together in the, in the uh, animal health and veterinary informatics world, um, particularly through what AVI is doing. 
So um, one thing that I want everybody watching this to understand is that inform informatics is not complex, okay? It literally can be as simple as how can we identify increasing incidence of a disease with the patients in my practice? It doesn't have to be a national or international effort. It often is and can be and should be in certain scope, but informatics as a thing can be a very limited scope and, and will still be productive. So a lot of people are put off by informatics because they don't know what it means or because they think it's not practical or useful or valuable to them, whereas it really is. It also doesn't necessarily involve technology. A lot of informatics work really literally is about um, some of the questions. What decisions are we trying to make? What trends are we looking for? Do we have the right data? How does this data set relate to that data set? What trends are we seeing? What other trends may be applicable to this and so forth? That's what really informatics is all about. So within a practice, within a region, within a, a discipline or, 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 or a disease state or anything like that, there are different segments that can benefit from some level of informatics. Okay. So that's the essence of what it is. Could go deeper. Probably not going to do that unless you have questions. But um, there are a lot of different opportunities to get involved with informatics, as I said, from a very large scale level, including academic programs. I didn't mention everybody's across the board. I mentioned a few that, uh, that I'm familiar with um, and all the way down to, uh, to doing it yourself. Um, and there are a lot of practices now who, once they start to learn about the different tools that are available and the different ideas that are out there for how they can participate either locally or, or, or in an area, um, a lot of practices will get together. I mean, we've heard, we've heard stories of practices who get together as a group, maybe within a, a state or a region, a county or whatever, and say, let's, let's just share some of our data together and see if there are any trends across what we see. I mean, that's basic informatics, right? Um, industry is starting to get materially involved with this now. So where, again, as I said, it, it primarily was academic and research before. Um, it is now uh, being supported materially by, uh, you know, the, the pharma companies and the insurance companies and all of the, the major industry uh, animal health players um, and as well uh, startups and innovators. So companies like mine, a small startup, um, there are a lot of us out there with varying motivations to support some aspect of animal health and of, of veterinary care. So, you know, your involvement with uh, pursuing an opportunity should really be based on, on the question, why? You know, I always like to say, why am I going to do this? What am I going to get out of this? How do I know that I've succeeded? How am I measuring success? Laurie knows what she wants to do here. There's a very clear path to that. If you're going to get involved, why are you going to do that? And then what resources do you have available, whether it's academic and research, whether it's commercial or, or whatever else? Um, I always advise people, if you're going to pick a company like mine, make sure you're doing it for the right reasons. So the challenges and obstacles, this is the thing I said I'd spend the most time on. There are a lot of things that prevent people from getting involved with informatics. The first thing is awareness. You say informatics, most people still don't know exactly what that means, and that's fine. That'll take some time. <laughs> no joke, we literally thought about changing our name once upon a time so that people would get it, but we decided not to because it's a very real and legitimate thing that we just need people to, to come to understand. So spread the word. Um, beyond awareness, though, it's understanding and skills. So uh, again, understanding what it, why we are doing what we're doing, what resources are involved, um, what tools may be involved. Again, it may or may not involve technology. Um, oftentimes it does. Has anybody here ever used Excel? I mean, some people haven't, but you know, there are very basic tools like that where you can actually do some pretty sophisticated informatics work. Um, or you can get into some of the more robust tools like, you know, Tableau and Tibco and so forth. And guess what? Tableau has a free tool that will let you visualize data. Just take your data from your practice management software or from your Excel spreadsheet, plop it in, see pretty charts, graphs, and move things around and look at how things are, uh, are shaping up. So again, it doesn't have to be expensive, it doesn't have to be complicated, um, you just have to know why you're doing it and then find the right resources. Certainly time is a big constraint um, and veterinary practices, of course, are in our discussion uh, here a key source of uh, of data and also desire, right? So we want 
veterinarians uh, to be able to participate in this, but veterinarians, for the most part, are very, very busy people, overly busy people, um, probably don't have a lot of time to think about this thing. So it is uh, incumbent upon us, um, meaning everybody who's surrounding and supporting the veterinary industry, to make uh, this type of capability available and not ask veterinarians and veterinary practices and, and those stakeholders to do all, all of this work. Um, as part of my outreach uh, work for AVI, one question I almost always ask somebody when they're thinking about joining or when I meet them is, why? Why do you want to join? What do you want to get out of this? What interests you? In fact, when we went to the, um, the, the Fetch conference and, and had our booth there a year and a half ago or whenever it was, um, we had a little, a little uh, display where we asked people to write it all down. You know, what, if there's one thing you wish you knew about something happening in your practice, what is it? I mean, ask yourself that question. If there's one thing you wish you knew, what is it? And then how can we help figure that out, okay? Chances are, if you want to know it, other people want to know it too. But we need to give you the time. We need to make it easy. Uh, ideally, we make it um, so easy that you don't even really have to do anything. You just have to agree to do it. So then we get to the last two, which are, uh, they go a little bit hand in hand, and they are a uh, very big topic nowadays. Um, so maybe you've read some articles, maybe you've heard some things about data privacy and the sharing of practice data. Um, and there certainly is a, a tremendous amount, of, well, there, there, there's, a, there's a tremendous amount of passion around whether or not practices should make data available. And then there's a tremendous amount of passion about with whom they should make it available and under what conditions and so forth. Um, without getting too specific about it, I, I have to say that it's fascinating to talk to practices, which is what we do all day, every day, because we support practices. And there are some practices who are so excited to make productive use of the data. And they're not looking to get millions of dollars for it. They just want to put it to productive use to help pets, to help animals. And if they know that this is happening and they know that they can understand that it's creating value, they're going to do it all day, every day. On the flip side, I've met so many practices who are scared. And they're rightfully so uh, that, that they're scared because um, there are so many misuses of the data. And, you know, you mentioned this, uh, you got to be careful with the double-edged sword. You know, the, uh, the data can be used for you, it can be used against you. You know, one way it can be used against you is it can just be lifted from you and, and you get nothing for it. And this has happened time and time again. So the industry itself is very aware of this now. And there are companies, many companies, who are explicitly addressing this head on, transparently looking to make sure that we can all be comfortable that things are being used in the right way. So my advice again is spread the word. It is possible to use data productively and have it used appropriately at the same time. You just have to ask the right questions and, uh, and make sure that this is happening. Uh, from the same perspective, uh, the ethics matter, there's, uh, so, so one of my board members, Kerry Marshall, wrote a very long article recently about uh, ethics in, in data. Um, and if you get a chance to look it up, um, it, it's, a, it's a great article. Uh, and it revolves around all of the aspects of how the data gets used, whether or not it's being put to an appropriate use, not only by the people that practices are sharing data with, like us, but also how the practices themselves are using the data. So one funny example, um, one of our practices um, said, you know, gee, so, so what we do is we, as I said before, we, we try to figure out what makes pet owners say yes to their veterinarians and get them to say yes more. And one of the things that one of our practices said is, I wish I, wish I could know which of my clients have money. <laughs> and well, we said, well, we could do that, right? So we could actually, through your data, we can figure out the spending habits of each of your clients and give you indicators of that in appointments. But that's not ethically appropriate, right? Because you're not supposed to treat different clients different ways based on their financial situation. You have to make the best possible recommendations and, and there it is. And so that's an example of, and he would, you know, he wasn't looking to be unethical, but he was, just, this is what I wish we could do. Well, you can do that. 
but should you do that? That ends up being the question. And that's something that, again, if you're going to start getting involved in any sort of data-oriented informatics or, or, or process, you want to make sure that you understand how the data is going to be used and that it's going to be used in an ethical way. So those are some of the challenges and obstacles. There are many, many resources. I, I, this is not a complete list by any stretch. I, uh, I kind of grabbed a few uh, resources off of the AVI website. Um, I did want to mention, you know, a little bit about AVI itself. So AVI is a, a volunteer-based organization. We have no staff, okay? And AVI doesn't deliver a product. We don't create things. As a matter of fact, because of the, 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 the charity status and so forth, we don't even get involved in projects like this because there's a lobbying component to it, so we can't. Um, but even if we could, the business that we're in is to help support and advise organizations like this and many others in the development of standards and conventions and, um, and networking, so bringing people together to help them find the right resources to get things done and so forth. Um, and that's really what the benefit is of being part of AVI is uh, basically you get out of it what you put into it, right? So if you participate, you get involved in some discussions, you connect with people um, and, and provide uh, advice, the, basically the way I'm doing right now, um, that's really what the organization is all about. And whether you like the term informatics or not, it's something worth looking into because um, you, you're, you'll get benefit from knowing what's going on in the industry around this emerging field of, of, uh, of using data. So uh, again, a little longer than maybe I had planned, but I do appreciate your time. Do you have any questions or anything? I'm sure we could do a Q&A, right? Yeah, we, we'll do that at the end if you want. You're going to do the end? Yeah. Okay, so Q&A at the end. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Peter. <laughs> Well, thank you, Peter. That was fabulous. Um, you know, you brought up something about this if I win, you lose type of mentality or that there's a pie and this pie is finite and it's not. It's an infinite pie, this data, the, these services, this outcome, these, the healing that can happen because of this. It's not a finite fixed thing where we only get a slice of the pie. I think it's a cultural mentality that we have to get over that if I get this big a piece, that means there's only this much left. That's not even true. So I think we need to get past that so that we can start sharing because that's where the benefit's really gonna come from. So thank you very much for that. Um, and now we have Dr. Amanda Bow Bowden from, <laughs> she's from, her name is Quebeca, so it's kind of hard to, I hope I didn't annihilate it. But anyway, she's with the Minnesota <laughs> Department of Public Health and she has a lot to say about this surveillance and their work there in Minnesota. So. Without further ado. Good evening, everyone. Yes, as, um, as Lori said, my name is Amanda Bedoin, and I am currently the director of One Health Antibiotic Stewardship at Minnesota Department of Health. And so what we've been talking about for the last you know, tw 20 minutes or so is surveillance and how we use data. And for the next few talks, what we're going to do is shift a little into one of the key areas for which surveillance data is imperative. And so what I'm going to be talking about is what, what we're working on in Minnesota and also a little bit about what happens with regard to antimicrobial resistance surveillance in healthcare. And then um, Dr. Granick after me is going to follow up with some real specifics about a surveillance system that we're looking to, to stand up. So I'm going to just start by talking about um, antimicrobial resistance in a general sense for folks who don't have a background in this it will be it will be brief um, and in antimicrobial use so as many of you know prior to the advent of antibiotics in healthcare there was really little that you could do for serious infections other than keep people comfortable but after the advent of antibiotics, things really changed. And, and this is a terrific quote. Uh, I think that you'll have access to these slides, so you'll be able to see it um, in more detail. But a terrific quote that expresses the enthusiasm when a antibiotics were um, first used in healthcare. And really what it comes down to is the last few lines of this, um, that we became convinced overnight that nothing lay beyond reach for the future medicine was off and running. And that's the type of enthusiasm that came about when we started using antibiotics in, in medicine. So, however, we do know that since that time, all of the antibiotics that have been introduced have been f into clinical medicine 
have been followed up by clinical antimicrobial resistance. Of course, this isn't universal resistance. We still have um, bugs that can be treated with certain antibiotics, but what we do see is some antibiotic, um, some anti some bacteria that are resistant to certain antibiotics. And this is a timeline that just shows the antibiotic de deployment on the top line and when antibiotic resistance was first observed clinically on the bottom line. And if all you can see is just the colors, you can see that um, shortly after any antimicrobial class was introduced, clinical resistance was seen. The second thing that you can see from this timeline, which starts at 1930 and ends this one at, at 2005, so it's not exactly current. But what you can see is we used to have a lot more antibiotic drugs deployed into clinical use. And as you get to the right end of the timeline here, we, we don't see that. There are much fewer um, options that are coming out new to the market. So that's where we are with regard to antibiotic um, availability and use. What does this mean from the standpoint of human health impact? So CDC estimates that each year over 2 million people have an antibiotic resistant infection, and that translates into about 23,000 deaths. This, these data are, are pretty old, so this is only a bigger problem now. But this translates into giant health care costs. So it's estimated, or was estimated, that this leads to $20 billion in human health care costs. And when we think about the cost of resistant infections in veterinary medicine, that has never been quantified because we, we don't have the means to quantify it, which is partially why we're here today. Um, but it, it is an incredible financial cost. The other thing that we all know in this room is that it's not just a financial cost, it's an emotional cost. There's a burden for a health care provider, for veterinarian, for a client, for patient. In 2019, you don't expect to be told, I'm sorry, there's nothing we can do for this infection. So that's an additional burden that is not just financial. CDC's identified what these threats are, and they can do that because there are robust surveillance systems to identify those bugs. It's estimated that by 2050, untreated, untreatable microbial infections are going to surpass cancer as the leading cause of death worldwide. So this is, this is an example um, that is a serious problem. And you hear about it, you read about it in the New York Times, you read about it everywhere. Um, and this is really how uh, Jen Granick and I got into thinking about companion animal disease surveillance because this is something that impacts healthcare, it impacts animals, and now is the time to ride this wave before it's too late. For those um, who aren't aware, many of you in this room are, just the general um, ways that resistance emerges. First is exposure to antibiotics, that over time, um, bacteria evolve to evade pressures that are put on them. So over time, bacteria that are exposed to antibiotics will accumulate point mutations that allows them to survive when that antibiotic is present and then replicate. Expansion of those that are resistant in the face of an antibiotic threat or, or um, pressure. The second way that uh, bacteria can acquire resistance is by sharing resistance genes. So genes that confer resistance cannot just um, be passed down from generation to generation of bacteria, but they can also be shared from one bug to another. This can happen inside the body of human and animals. It can happen in our environment, both our built environment, like our healthcare settings, as well as our natural environment. So this is why it's really important for us to know what's going on, where are resistance genes, where are resistant organisms, because we need to have an awareness of how they're spreading. Now, I don't think that I said it at the very beginning. Um, I might have said what my title is, but what it is that I do every day is I focus on this issue of antimicrobial resistance and antibiotic use across what we call the One Health Spectrum. So One Health is the understanding that human, animal, and environmental health are connected. So the health of humans, in particular, is dependent upon having a, hum a healthy animal population, both food animals, companion animals, and a healthy natural environment. And antibiotic resistance is a key One Health uh, issue. And why is that? This is because all antibiotic use, no matter what sector we're using those antibiotics in, can contribute to the development of antibiotic resistance. So this means um, 
when we're using it in outpatient clinics, in human hospitals, in nursing homes, when we're using it at the vet clinic or on the farm, but also perhaps when we're using it in industrial processes like um, development of um, probiotics, uh, ethanol production, there are many places where we use antibiotics, so we have to keep them all in mind. The development of resistance, resistance is complex. We've all in the veterinary profession heard that it's our fault, particularly it's the, the large animal, um, food animal producer's fault that we have antimicrobial resistance, which is um, not true. Um, and it would be beautiful if we were able to actually draw a conclusion like that, but the problem of resistance is so complex that, that that's much too simplistic of, of an argument, no matter whose finger's pointing at who. It's a complex situation that requires a comprehensive approach. We also know that we are exposed to resistant bugs, not just in the area from which they emerge. So we can get um, resistant Staph aureus infections in the community, as well as we can pick them up in the hospital. And then what's really great for our purposes as veter veterinarians in particular, is that the methods of preventing resistance are similar in healthcare and veterinary medicine. And in healthcare, they've been working on this problem for a really long time, so we have a lot of tools that we can now use to improve um, antibiotic resistance in vet med. And then just lastly, to sort of close up this, this piece about um, why we care about resistance, why is this a problem, in pets, we have similar issues that we have in clinical health care. We have resistant infections that can't be treated. We also um, know that we don't have the resources necessarily to always be doing culture and sensitivity so that we're doing a, um, a really good bug drug match when we're choosing an antibiotic for treatment. And we know that we're treating our pets with medically important antimicrobials. So the antimicrobials that are important to human health are also used in our small animal clinics. And then we're in very close contact with our pets. Um, you know, they're, they're sleeping in our beds, we're eating a sandwich, they're licking our hands, then we're eating our cookie. Like, this is, this is not just direct contact, it's close direct contact. We know that we share microbiota with pets in our household. A household of two people with a dog, those two humans share more bacteria across their skin than two people in a household without a dog. Not only do they share more bacteria, they also have a higher diversity of bacteria. So the dog is really just a fomite. They do see the same thing with children in a household, but dogs even, even more strongly associated with mixing your bugs. And then the last thing to note about why we really care about this um, AMR issue in companion animal medicine is because our companion animal hospitals are similar to human hospitals in that they are a source of serious resistant bugs. Um, just a very small survey of E. coli isolated at the University of Minnesota Veterinary, um, Teaching, or Veterinary Medical Center showed that of the E. coli isolated from the ICU, 37% were multidrug resistant. Those bugs, uh, those E. coli bacteria that were isolated from the general practice, animals seen at the university but in the general practice, only 4% were multidrug resistant. So where we use antibiotics, that's where we're seeing the resistance. That's why this is an important issue. So what are we supposed to do about it? Centers for Disease Control and Prevention has identified four ways for us to combat resistance. One, prevent infections. Two, track infections. Three, improve our use of antibiotics. And four, develop new drugs. So tonight, what we're talking about, surveillance, touches on number two and three tracking infections, and improving antibiotic prescribing, also known as antibiotic stewardship. Okay, so what are they doing in healthcare? What can we learn? Luckily for all of us as patients, we have robust antimicrobial resistance tracking in, um, uh, in the United States. We have community-based surveillance, for multidrug resistant infections, including invasive infections of things that, that aren't necessarily, um, yeah, so for, uh, for example, Staphylococcus aureus. We carry Staph aureus a lot, but what we care about is when those infections are invasive, when they're critical, when they're severe, and when they're resistant. We also have robust surveillance for foodborne infections. In the United States, we have a strong hospital-based surveillance system looking at antimicrobial resistance, healthcare-associated infections, so you shouldn't really think that you go into the, the hospital and um, 
get a new infection in the hospital. Nobody wants to do that. And luckily, we're tracking those infections. And we track um, adverse outcomes like Clostridioides difficile, which can be associated with antibiotic use, but it can also be um, you know, something that is transmitted within a healthcare setting. So we're tracking resistance in human populations. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention has a robust antibiotic resistance laboratory network. And this network addresses gaps in individual laboratories by providing expert gold standard techniques in several regions of the United States. So I, you know, I'm not going to talk about a lot of details about this other than it exists. And it's really important because anybody in a state that does not have one of these regional laboratories can send um, isolates to a regional laboratory and have additional testing done because that's what we do in this national um, laboratory network. In healthcare and in human population based surveillance, these data that we have available, they drive what we do. They drive how we respond. We can identify clusters and respond to them when we see infections in healthcare facilities, when we see infections in communities. This is both containment actions, like, okay, how do we make sure this serious bug doesn't spread around in a hospital, in a region, from a nursing home to a, to, um, uh, back to a community? But it also allows us to put into place preventive actions to keep that from happening in the future. The data also helps us to develop antibiograms to know what are the susceptibility profiles and how should we be choosing antibiotics. It helps us to develop antibiotic prescribing guidelines and multi-drug resistant organism information systems. So an awareness system for hospitals to know when someone might be being transferred to them with a resistant bug. I think you are also aware that we have a resistance, um, antimicrobial resistance surveillance system that's integrated, that takes human data and animal data and retail meat data and combines it in, integrated, in an integrated fashion. So we, ha we have all of these um, things for resistance. We also have data on, uh, for humans on antibiotic use. Individual facilities and healthcare systems have access to their own data. They can use pharmacy systems. They can use their electronic medical record system. They also participate in national surveillance that then spits back information to them that they can use on the ground. And they have access to medical claims data. For academics and people in public health, we have access to claims data as well, national level data sets, quality measures, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There are data available. Um, how do we measure antibiotic use? We can measure overall use. We can also tell if it's appropriate, which is arguably more important and more interesting. And then we can um, use that information to drill down to know who's prescribing what. I have two slides here just to show the value of antibiotic use data for healthcare, because this is what has driven where funding goes, this is what's driven, um, what your provider tells you, what you see in public awareness campaigns. What we know from nationally acquired data is that 50% of hospitalized patients are on an antibiotic at any given point in time. However, 20 to 50% of that use is likely inappropriate or unnecessary. In long-term care, so in nursing homes, and this is important as we have an aging population, I think for even family members to be aware, that at any given point in time, uh, someone in a nursing home in the US has an 11% chance of being on an antibiotic. And up to 75% of long-term care antibiotics are prescribed incorrectly. And they're often overprescribed for the same things that we have challenges in veterinary medicine on, urinary tract infection, respiratory tract infection. But the way that we learn this is from having unified data. And then lastly, in outpatient, so this is for all of you guys when you go in, especially in respiratory tract season, we have five scripts written every year, um, written for every six people each year. And 13% of any visits results in an antibiotic prescription, 30% of which are not necessary or are inappropriate. And over 50% when we're looking specifically at upper respiratory tract infections are inappropriate. And so, this is the information that drives how we make change. If we didn't have these data, we wouldn't be able to do that. And what really drives behavioral change of prescribers is something called benchmarking. So it's being able to compare your practices to practices of someone else. 
especially someone else that's similar to you. It doesn't make sense to compare apples to oranges, but in a good benchmarking system, you're able to standardize the data and compare apples to apples. So in, um, in healthcare, there is a national system uh, for looking at hospital data on antimicrobial use, and those data are standardized to make sure that it's comparing apples to apples. That's called risk adjustment. Now, this is just a, a flow chart of what happens in hospitals when they report data to CDC, and this is how we now have a robust hospital-based antibiotic use surveillance system. Data are sent from the hospital, medical administration record data. It is processed through some health IT vendor services or software, so large electronic health record companies are, make this possible. It's formatted in something that I'm sure Peter knows about that I don't necessarily, but it's formatted appropriately so that then it is sent to the National Healthcare Safety Network at CDC. Those data are compiled the risk, uh, the risk um, adjustment is conducted, and then those data are then fed back so that hospitals can see how they are doing compared to others. And CDC can see how we're doing nationally, and I at the State Health Department can see how we're doing in the state of Minnesota. So anyway, after all of that, the reason that I'm here and what I spend all day doing in Minnesota is talking about what is the relevance of the healthcare experience to veterinary medicine? In Minnesota, we have decided that we're going to address this issue across human, animal, and environmental health. And what that actually looks like, just to give you a taste of why Jen and I work closely together all the time, what this looks like in Minnesota is a One Health Stewardship Collaborative. And it's made up of people from human, Animal and uh, human and animal clinical practice. It's made up of folks from industry. We have representation from all of our major commodity groups: Minnesota pork, Minnesota milk, um, turkey growers, etc. We have academics, and the list goes on and on and on. Um, and you can see it actually on this slide. And we come together to, as our vision says. Uh, work together to raise awareness and change behaviors to preserve antibiotics and treat infections effectively. It's one thing just to chit chat about them, but what we're doing, for example, here today is putting that into practice. Um, so what we are looking to do is use evidence-based approaches from one healthcare setting or, or from healthcare and apply them um, with the appropriate adjustments to other uh, clinic-based settings for example, veterinary medicine. So that's how we approach this in the state of Minnesota. And we also approach our public awareness and our, our um, messaging for providers in a One Health way. So this is our new Only When Needed campaign for antibiotics. And we have three different slogans, uh, or we have one slogan, but it's adjusted for everyone's use. What we're saying is only when needed or own. So own the problem, own the solution, own your health. We make this available for veterinarians so that it says own the problem, own the solution, own your pet's health because we're all in this together and we have the same solutions. There are some materials um, that we've developed in Minnesota that are available on the, on the back table there. You're welcome to take them. We also have a robust website. And um, if you're interested in any of the materials that we have, talk to me. Um, and um, I'll give you the link, or you can get it from the, from the table in the back. But that's a little bit about what we do, and Jen's got to tie it together here for surveillance. Mm -hmm. All right. Hi, Alan. <laughs> Thanks for staying awake. <laughs> All right. Um, so uh, thank you, Amanda. We, we switched the order because she kind of beautifully set up, you know, what is possible with surveillance? We know in the United States that there's a lot possible with um, disease surveillance and antibiotic use surveillance, but we haven't achieved that yet in companion animals. And so that's something that, you know, we have been working to do. And um, with the help of Alan, who's on the computer, you guys can't see him, but I can. Mm -hmm. um, so. 
So as Amanda said, you, the problem of antimicrobial resistance is not limited to humans. And that's why we're all here, right? We care about antimicrobial resistance in our companion animals. So as Amanda stated, there's, a, there's robust surveillance in human medicine. The Centers for Disease Control um, and Prevention makes that happen. And this is, you know, in their world, how antibiotic resistance spreads in a community. Um, you know, a, a person gets a, a, an infection and is treated with antibiotics, whether that's in a hospital setting or an outpatient setting, and can affect others in the community or in that patient care, um, care setting um, if resistance spreads among them. Um, the agricultural animals come into play um, because they are treated with antimicrobials as well, and so resistance can occur in um, agricultural species as easily as it can in humans. Um, but in my mind, right, and I'm sure in all of yours, there's something importantly missing from this graphic, and so I've taken the liberty to add it, um, and it's our companion animals. And so um, we've already heard about how companion animals interact with us in our daily lives. They share our environments and sometimes our ice cream cones, um, and they're treated with antibiotics in those same classes that we are treated with when we get sick. And then um, they eat meat-based diets, so the same risk of, um, resistant um, organisms from agricultural um, sources is probably even more significant in our pets because there's a trend now to treat raw, to feed our pets raw pet food. And so, um, you know, which I don't recommend. I, don't recommend. <laughs> I do not recommend. Um, and so, so we're putting them at risk. And, you know, in, in Europe, for example, um, there's, there's this paper that came out a few years ago looking at um, antibiotic susceptibility patterns in different uh, bacterial isolates across multiple countries. And so th this is just one little snapshot of this larger um, paper. But what it showed is, and um, I'm highlighting UK, because they're, um, the University of Liverpool is gonna be our partner in the surveillance network that we're gonna get up and running here. But in the UK, up to 25% of E. coli isolates are pan-resistant to antibiotics, meaning resistant to, resistant to multiple antibiotics. Um, and that's one in four, right? So that's pretty scary. And there's no reason to believe that we don't have those same types of susceptibility patterns here. Um, and Amanda already showed you our University of Minnesota um, ICU data showing that we in our ICU patients have resistant organisms. And I just wanna point out that Amanda said that we get resistant organisms in places that we use antibiotics, but remember in our institution, we're often a secondary tertiary care institution, so those animals have been treated elsewhere before they came into us. So just because we're seeing and measuring their resistance in the ICU setting does not mean that they didn't get that resistance when they were treated at their primary care clinic or a secondary clinic. So we're all, we're all responsible, right, for the antibiotics that we choose to treat our patients with, we're responsible for what that outcome is. And, you know, as veterinarians, the outcome we always want to be positive, and I'll talk a little bit more about some of our motivations for prescribing. Um, but first, I wanna give you, um, I'll give you another face of AMR. So this is one that came into our hospital recently. We, I'm, we're in the Twin, City, Twin Cities of Minnesota. Um, and so we get um, referrals from North Dakota, South Dakota, Iowa, was Northern Wisconsin, and, and Minnesota, so we cut in Canada too. Um, this dog was a dog that lived in North Dakota. Well, he, he still does. He lives in North Dakota. Um, he's a young and very silly Labrador retriever named Peter, um, and he busted both of his knees. So he had bilateral um, ACLs, is what we call it in, in people, but um, uh, cruciate ligament ruptures. And so he needed a surgical repair. And so in large dogs, we do a surgical repair that typically involves placing a bone implant. So you can see that this metal here is not dog. It's something that we introduced to the dog. And we did that by making an incision and creating some tissue trauma and then adding this, um, th this implant. Well, infection control is really important in those settings. And in North Dakota, there's no large institutional or teaching hospital. So what, the, what happened was that this dog had a traveling um, surgeon come to the primary care facility and do the surgery and, and leave. And then this dog ended up getting um, an infection. 
associated, pulled a couple stitches, got an infection associated with his incision site, developed a fever of 104, became pretty sick, um, came, and this is in the face of antibiotics. He was actually sent home on antibiotics. So in the face of being on a third generation cephalus born, developed this infection and this fever. Um, and so he eventually came down to the University of Minnesota because a switch in antibiotics and some hospital care in North Dakota, he was still not getting better. So ultimately what happened is that he came into our institution and the, those implants had to be completely removed. When um, his, uh, his um, the screw from the implant was cultured, it grew, I don't know if you guys can see this, but this is, have you seen, it's a little MRSA doll. So it says superbug, that's why he's wearing a cape. But <laughs> so what we grew was methicillin resistant Staph aureus. And so for those of you that don't know, Staph aureus is typically an organism that is on people. So, you know, we are normally colonized, or many of us are normally colonized with Staph aureus. There's a different staff that dogs are typically colonized with. So the source of this at some point was likely a human, and it's a very resistant infection that this dog has. And so we have really limited options. And when, when I started practicing veterinary medicine, this was very, very uncommon. And now it is very common that we see these resistant organisms. And we're faced often with ethical dilemmas about what can we use to treat. Um, I wasn't gonna talk about this case, but we had a case in our hospital, um, a patient that had bilateral um, stents in the ureters, so the tubes that connect the kidneys to the bladder, and the dog got in, th those became infected um, to the point that the only antibiotics that were available to use were antibiotics that were really just reserved for critically important infections in people. And so it becomes an ethical dilemma for us veterinarians to decide what can we offer to treat? Is it, is it ethical to treat, especially if we don't think that we can ultimately clear this infection? And so this is what we're faced with now. And unfortunately, we're all doing different things because we don't have the data to support a clear way forward. And that's what we're trying to get. So to recap, Antimicrobial resistance is a big problem and it's growing in our companion animals. Um, it, AMR affects companion animals and, um, and AMR in companion animals likely affects people, but also vice versa, like I just showed you with a patient with Staph aureus. And so, you know, how do we get there? Well, you know, right now we have to take a step back and look at what our own prescribing behavior is and we have really limited data on that. We have a few um, bits of information uh, from survey data, so veterinarians are, um, in a survey, they, they, they can choose whether or not they respond, they can choose whether or not they're honest, right? So, you know, if, they, if I were to be surveyed, how many cookies did I eat? You know, I might say one, even though I said three, because I'm embarrassed, right? Um, we have data from individual institutions as well, but what we really need is global data. And so, but what we do know um, is what we all suspect, is that most veterinarians are going on their intuition for treatment instead of available guidelines, if they are even aware that guidelines exist, um, that we're not often culturing, and that's, there's, there's a lot of factors into whether or not we're offering culture and whether or not culture is accepted when we offer it. Um, and we know that uh, at least in, in one study of a veterinary teaching hospital, up to 38% of inf uh, patients that were treated with an antibiotic had no documented evidence of infection. So we need, to, we need to know more because veterinarians need that data to make improvements. Why do, we, why do we make the decisions that we make? Well, there's lots of determinants for how we prescribe. Um, and it's not just the patient has an infection or I think the patient has an infection, therefore I'm gonna prescribe something. There's a whole lot that goes into this. Um, so what are the, so this is, this is a human model. So what are the, um, what are the pet owner's attitudes, right? And, and concerns and desires. What is the, what are the experience of the individual veterinarian? What does the practice culture, um, what is that like? And how's that, that, how does that affect how antibiotics are prescribed? Um, what are the cultural beliefs? Uh, what's the hierarchy in the practice? There's so many things that go into it. Ultimately though, veterinarians just wanna help their patients. Antibiotics, when we prescribe antibiotics, this is an emotional process. 
you know, veterinarians care deeply for their patients, which is why they got into the profession in the first place. It's not the glory or the money, right? Um, we care deeply for our patients and oftentimes we're prescribing because we don't know what else to do. So, you know, it's hard to think about public health or pink, think about the greater good or anything outside of the exam room when we have a dog in front of us that's sick and we don't know exactly why, but it belongs to an 85 year old gentleman who just lost his wife and this dog was his wife's dog. And this is the last living thing that he has of her and he has a connection with this dog that we can't even begin to understand but we can feel it, right? And so we want to do something for them. And so what happens is we do a lot of this. We do a lot of just in case antibiotic prescriptions. And this type of behavior is going to be really hard for us to change. And the only way we're going to be able to do that is with data. So what is just in case antibiotics? Um, it's, the, it's the misguided perception that antibiotics are safe and pose little risk. And I'll tell you, when I came up through vet school, this was the attitude that we have. We don't know what's going on, we'll give it antibiotics just in case because it'll probably help. And even if it doesn't, it's unlikely to hurt. But now we know better, right? Um, we know that we all took a pledge to do no harm. And we know that antibiotics can cause toxic toxicities and adverse reactions. We can um, we can drive the development of multi-drug resistance, and we can disrupt the microbiome, which we're learning more and more about, and we understand now that the microbiome is important for whole body health. So this is um, a study on, in human medicine where they looked at the consequences of unnecessary antibiotic prescriptions in an outpatient setting. 20% of patients that were given an unnecessary antibiotic developed an adverse drug reaction. 20%, that's one in five. Um, 6% developed a multi-drug resistant infection within 90 days. So inappropriate antibiotic prescribing does result in multi-drug resistant infections. And that is a major adverse um, uh, event that we, could, we, we need to be aware of and we need to try to avoid. Um, we need data in order to, to try to understand the nature of the problem, the complexity of the problem, the size of the problem, and, um, and then not only that, but the interventions that we can target to improve the way we're prescribing. And Amanda showed you this um, timeline of when antibiotics were put on the market and when we started to see clinical resistance. What was missing from the end of that were these veterinary um, specific antibiotics. So cefavacin um, or convenia is a third generation cephalosporin, which came out in the mid um, two, 2000s. We um, already have resistant infections to that. Pratofloxacin is a late generation fluoroquinolone that's marketed for cats. Three years after that was deployed, we started to see clinical resistance. So as fast as we can get these things out, we're seeing resistant infections. And it's, you know, that's the nature of bacteria. But the way that we can avoid this sort of speed of um, resistant infection is to improve the way that we use antibiotics. So. Uh, Amanda already told you that the sol one of the solutions, there are multiple solutions, right? Um, and, and we need to use them all together. But one of the solutions that we can affect is antimicrobial stewardship. And we, every single prescriber has the power to use this tool, right? But what is antimicrobial stewardship and how do we apply that in our clinical setting? Well, the um, antimicrobial stu stewardship is, is simply improving the way that we utilize antibiotics. So it's focused on selecting the right antibiotic and culture and sensitivity and even cytology can help us with that. You, choosing the right dose. Um, we're learning more about dosing antibiotics and um, getting drugs to a level that prevents mutations. Um, and then uh, the right duration. And we have really little limited information about duration of antimicrobial prescriptions in veterinary medicine, but with a surveillance network, we could start to understand what's the, what's the average time. Is there a specific set of clinics that has a significantly decreased um, duration of antibiotic use for X, Y, or Z uh, infection? And do they have different outcomes? So um, we could get global pictures of this. The AVMA has recently come out with their core principles of antimicrobial stewardship, and um, similar to CDC's, and those are commit to stewardship, advocate for a system of care to prevent common disease, so infection control and, pre and preventative care, 
select and use antimicrobial drugs judiciously, i.e. antimicrobial stewardship, evaluate antimicrobial drug use practices. So how do we evaluate that? Well, surveillance can help us with that and educate and build expertise and we can collect data to inform our prescribers and inform um, pet owners so that we can build expertise in this area. So the things that uh, surveillance can help us with are really these, um, these last two. So how can data affect change in prescribing behavior? Like how can we actually do this in veterinary medicine? Um, well, we can learn from surveillance how antibiotics are used for what can common conditions in pets. We can determine how we are prescribing, how often we're doing culture and sensitivity testing. We can track antibiotic resistant bacteria. Um, and we can identify through all of that information specific targets for antimicrobial stewardship intervention. Simple, easy things that all veterinarians can do, um, but we need to give them the data in order to do that. So we have to empower veterinarians to improve antibiotic prescribing. So what can we do with the data that we get? So what sort of tools could we create? Um, Amanda referenced antibiograms, and so they're just sort of collated data that says for E. coli in the urine in this institution, this is the uh, average susceptibility. And so we can look at changes over time to understand how our antibiotic prescribing is changing what our resistance patterns are looking like. We can um, use information to determine optimal dose or duration for treatment and then use that to provide guidelines for treatment. We can use, as Amanda said, this data for benchmarking, which is going to be the huge behavioral trigger, right? If we know what we're doing and we can compare that to what others are doing, um, and maybe they have better outcomes, we might be motivated to change our behavior. And then we can intervene and then monitor changes in a practice or a region over time so that we know if our interventions are working or not. So how, how can we do this in veterinary medicine? Um, we can use really low tech data or informatics, right? <laughs> or we can use high tech um, methods. And so what we're trying to do in Minnesota is actually both. Um, so we're utilizing point prevalence surveys with simple Excel tools. Um, where all clinics can par participate regardless of what their medical record system looks like. There's minimal equipment or technical expertise needed, um, just a little bit of effort to collect data out of medical records. We can also use a high-tech method, and you can see this, this um, blue, uh, I don't know what, like radar <laughs> um, graphic in the bottom. So this is um, what's been going on in the University of Liverpool for the last 10 years the Small Animal Veterinary Surveillance Network, and what they've been able to do is use electronic health records to pull all this data that we're talking about, collate it, and present it back to veterinarians so that they can benchmark their own practices. Um, this is a, a high-tech uh, path. It requires support, technical expertise, um, and uh, on the part of the administrators of the surveillance, surveillance network, but for the participating veterinarians, it's really passive. All they have to do is put in their medical records as they normally would, and then take a few seconds of their time to enter a little bit of extra data. And so this is what we're trying to replicate in the University of Minnesota, and I'll get to that in a second. So what we're doing currently, because it is low tech and low expertise, is we're um, in the midst of doing a point prevalence survey. And I'll tell you a little bit about point prevalence surveys so you understand how they can be useful. So point prevalence um, survey methodology is used to define national rates of healthcare associated infections in people and antibiotic use in um, hospitals and long-term care settings. So nursing homes, um, and healthcare associated infections in hospitals are two areas that these are commonly used. Um, just a little bit of data is collected on one single day at multiple institutions or can be collected over a period of time. The data can be collected prospectively or retrospectively and can be repeated um, to, to get trends. Um, and the tools that are often used are really simple, like Excel-based tools, and the key is creating 
SOPs for data extraction and definitions um, to make everything standardized, but this is a really powerful tool. And so, as Amanda said, what we're doing in Minnesota is we're taking um, techniques from the human healthcare and applying them to veterinary medicine to give us the information that we need. And so we are running a pilot of our point prevalence survey at the University of Minnesota Veterinary Medical Center. Um, we collect data the first Monday of every month. We start in November of 2018, so we're about six months in. Um, we are surveying inpatients, so we're collecting um, data from medical records of all inpatients at four o'clock on Mondays, uh, the first Monday of the month, as well as outpatients um, that are seen during the entire day on select services. We are gathering data from electronic medical records, laboratory reports, treatment sheets, and the goal is that we want to define the rate of prescribing by each service and by prescriber type. So what's the experience level of the prescriber? Is it a faculty on staff? Is it a house officer like a resident or an intern? And we want to describe the drugs, drug classes, indications as well for antibiotic use. And so this is just a sample of some of the data that we're, that we're pulling out. Um, the most important, I would say, is what are the drugs used what, um, are they, and what are different services doing, um, as well as what's the indication for treatment and whether or not there were any diagnostics performed to support antimicrobial treatment in that patient. And so um, what are our outcome measures, the percentage of inpatients on antibiotics and the per percentage of outpatients that were prescribed antibiotics, summary of drug classes um, by overall, by service, by prescriber, and by syndrome, appropriateness of the prescription and the drug selection, and the percentage of patients that were receiving any diagnostic testing associated with a presumed infection. So what are the outcomes that we hope to achieve? We want to compare prescribing behavior with current guidelines. There are a few guidelines for antibiotic prescribing and companion animals, and um, those are considered currently best practices, and so are we, are we maintaining best practices in our patients or in our prescribing? Um, we want to identify targets in our hospital for stewardship, so where could we do better, and what is, what's a low-hanging fruit there? We want to create practice awareness, and so this is really important. If we make practitioners aware of what they're doing, then that's data that they can utilize to change. So we all, I think, recognize that antimicrobial resistance is a problem, and we could even go f as far to say we think antimicrobial resistance in companion animals is a public health problem, right? But what's really, really hard to say is what I do affects AMR in my patient population or in the greater um, community. And so that, that's really hard, but if we can provide data, then that might be something that might change my mind about what I do. Even when I'm in the room with the, with the owner, with a, a dog that I just need to do something for. I might find something else to do if I have this data in the back of my mind. Um, and then lastly, what we want to do with our point prevalence survey is we want to create a validated tool that we can then take and apply to other teaching hospitals across the country, but more importantly, modify and apply to um, general practices. And so uh, we have just received internal funding, so we'll have a um, project manager, and one of our goals um, over the coming two years is to deploy this tool and do point prevalence surveys of antibiotic use in um, veterinary practices across Minnesota. So some preliminary data from our point prevalence survey at the University of Minnesota. Um, this is just some of the information that we can get out. So we can say inpatients are in red, outpatients are in white, and we can look by service to see what our prescribing is. So for internal medicine, that's my service, um, we have a, a really high percentage of our inpatients are on antibiotics, but our outpatient prescribing is a lot smaller. Um, in surgery, it's a bit opposite. So their inpatients uh, are not as often on antibiotics, but their outpatients um, are prescribed more often. And so um, this gives us some insight in, in what we're doing and how we compare across services. Mm -hmm. um, we can also look at the types of antibiotics that we're prescribing. So for um, inpatients and outpatients, the number one class of drugs that we're using are penicillins. Um, and you can see for outpatients, we actually have in pink here quite a lot of topical antibiotic use, so that's good. I mean, sometimes we're going to find data that's going to say, hey, we're doing a good job, right? Because if we can avoid systemic antibiotics, then we're not treating all the microbes in the body. Um, but what we found in our hospital population so far is not dissimilar to what that stu uh, study that I showed you a few slides back was, is that 
um, we have a pretty substantial portion, almost a third of patients that are prescribed antibiotics, both inpatient and outpatient, at our hospital that have no documented evidence of infection. So maybe they do have evidence of infection, but it's not documented in the medical record. And so that's an area that we need to kind of drill down and understand the reasons why and where that's happening so that we can um, intervene. So that's our low tech tool. Um, and what we are um, trying to create in Minnesota is basically uh, replicating what the University of Liverpool has done really successfully for the last 10 years. They have created a small animal veterinary surveillance network, and we would like to essentially mimic that, work with them and mi mimic that in Minnesota, and then hopefully spread that throughout um, the country, so interested um, veterinary um, populations. Uh, all the data, as I said before, is collected from electronic health records, but the beauty of this is that if you Google electronic health records in veterinary medicine, you'll get like 40 of them, you know, right off the bat. So they're, they're really diverse. And what SAVSNET has been able to do is they've been able to work with these diverse veterinary medical record systems and extract data and then not just extract data, but extract it and collate it in a meaningful way to provide information to um, practitioners. And so the focus, as Amanda said, um, it, that we are really concerned about is antibiotic use and antibiotic um, resistance, but obviously a surveillance network like this can do so much more. So syndromic surveillance will help with um, outbreak investigation and identification of new diseases or diseases new to an area. Um, we'll make practitioners aware of trends in all sorts of things like ticks and um, vomiting and, and all, and so, you know, the, if I think about what this could provide for us, it's just astronomical. So we're really excited about getting this up and going. We've had some internal funding um, at the University of Minnesota that's going to finally allow the, us to get this off the ground. Um, we have done some preliminary work in Minnesota, and that is to survey our veterinarians in the state to, one, find out if they're even interested in this, and this is just one small question we ask them in general, do you think veterinarians should be able to contribute anonymized data for animal health surveillance? And overwhelmingly, they said, yes, absolutely. Um, and the ones that didn't, most of them said, well, I don't know. There were very few that said no. So we have support for this in our state. We also um, asked questions about what are the electronic medical record systems that they're using so that we can use those to target so that we can get them to be the first to onboard onto our system. Um, and this is a QR code. Um, and I think that it's available on all the pamphlets that Lori printed out as well. So if you use that, that'll link you to the same survey. And then if you give us that same information about veterinarians in Connecticut, then we then can expand the network, right? Um, so I just wanted to give you some ideas of what are the possibilities once we get a network up and, and running. So again, this is information from the Small Animal Veterinary Surveillance Network at the University of Liverpool. Um, you should Google them and check out their website. They have a lot of information there and it'll give you, I, I think it'll make you really excited about what we could do here. So an example is that um, they can track antibiotic prescriptions and so um, and, and look at what prescriptions are common in dogs and cats. And we can see that the most common antibiotic prescription in dogs in UK practices is, clav is basically Clavamox, what we call Clavamox here. But in cats, it's third generation cephalosporins, so what we would call Convenia. Um, and that's concerning because third generation cephalosporins are probably an escalation of what we often need. Um, this is a paper that SAVSNET produced that looks specifically at the use of that third generation cephalosporin um, when it was noted in the electronic medical um, health records. And in patients that prescribe this third generation cephalosporin, only a half a percent of owners were offered, or was only in, documented in the medical record, half a percent of patients prescribed were documented to have been offered a culture insensitivity. So it's possible that more than that was re recommended, but it wasn't documented in the medical record. Um, culture was offered and declined in 1.4%. So w this is an area now that folks in the UK can say, this is an easy place to intervene. Before prescribing uh, third generation cephalosporin, we could do a better job at offering culture to make sure that that prescription is appropriate, right? Um, and 
The reason why we care about that is that third generation cephalosporins are on the World Health Organization's list of highest priority critically important antimicrobials. And this is our most commonly used drug in cats, right? It, most commonly used antimicrobial. Um, so again, this is more data from Safnet showing, um, you know, how often felines are prescribed that drug. So um, this data again, sorry, am I going too far over time? I get too excited. Okay. Be excited. Yes, be excited. Okay. Um, so I, we can identify targets for intervention, right? Um, so uh, again, this is a paper that SAVSNET produced looking at um, surveillance of uh, pharmacosurveillance, so for surveillance of drug use. Um, and they found that um, second to vaccines, antibiotics are the most frequently prescribed medication. Um, and 50% of cats and 40% of dogs that come in for a consult receive an antibiotic. So that's, so that's pretty similar to what we found in human healthcare. So it's pretty amazing, right? Human prescribers, their behavior is very similar to our behavior, right? But we didn't know that before this data was available. Um, and uh, so that's in respiratory cases. In, um, in acute uh, GI cases, 38% of dogs and 29% of cats were prescribed an antibiotic. And so the question is, is that, is that needed? We don't have guidelines for GI disease, but we need to gather data so that we can determine where it is that we need to put our efforts. So when I see this data, I say, we need to get more information about treatment right? Treatment, what do we treat with and what that treatment duration should be for GI cases, right? Is antibiotics the appropriate thing that we should be using for acute diarrheas or are there other alternatives? And could we do studies where we compare antibiotics versus maybe a food intervention head to head? But without this data, I wouldn't know where to ask for funding so that I can go and answer that question. So this type of data gives us the it, it, it provides sometimes more questions, but those questions can then be very directed so we can figure out what we need to know in veterinary medicine. What, in, what data do we still need? And there's a lot of it, but this can help target us. Um, sorry, I'm very excited. So other things that this data can do, it can provide tools for prescribers. And so another thing that SAVSNET is doing is they're providing local antibiograms for prescribers. And so here's an example of E. coli and third generation cephalosporin resistance patterns in, in areas in the UK. And so um, that's really powerful information so that we, especially, you know, it's, it's powerful for the veterinarians that's prescribing, but also for the whole veterinary community if we can track this over time. We can look at changes. Um, and then the other thing that is provided directly back to the veterinarians is benchmarking. And again, Amanda talked about how important benchmarking is for changing behavior. And so this is one particular um, practitioner. We can see what their cephalosporin use is compared to the collective data. And so that can be very motivating. And again, just to remind you that this is not all about antibiotic use and um, antibiotic resistance data, even though that's what I'm very excited about. Um, we can use this to, gui to guide preventative care. Um, so if we can improve prevention, then we can decrease the amount of antibiotics that are actually needed. And so this graph is showing tick, um, uh, tick occurrences in, uh, noted in veterinary medical records in dogs and cats, and we can see that it um, fluctuates seasonally. Well, this is really a powerful tool for a veterinarian to talk then to their client about prevention. Um, and so I'm going to summarize. So um, again, this type of data is important for pets, people, and, and public health officials. Surveillance um, is important not only for uh, AMR and um, antibiotic use, but also for uh, companion animal diseases, including those that are mm -hmm. zoonotic, meaning that people can get as well. Mm -hmm. um, this data is really critical for benchmarking so that we can start to affect behavior. We can tar um, identify targets for intervention and provide practice guidelines. And so, um, I just wanted to make you aware of a couple of other things. So Juliana is going to talk next, and um, we're uh, Juliana and Amanda. There's there's a whole bunch of people working on this and getting together. I feel like we're like, you know, those sticky balls that bounce and then glob together. You know, or the like Legos. Yeah. Okay. We're just building something bigger. And so um, some of the things that we hope to do, um, in addition to creating um, a, a SAVSnet in, in the United States, which we're calling CAVSnet. 
Um, and so the, the companion animal um, veterinary surveillance network, because we'd like to include um, c other companion animals like horses as well. So some things that we're intending to do is to survey veterinarians about how they feel about privacy. So some of the things that Peter already talked about. Um, we want to talk about, um, or we want to um, use other low tech tools. So um, the group in Liverpool has a simple Excel tool that allows veterinarians to, even if they are not connected to SAVSNET, input antibiotic use information, and then they send that to the university, and, um, and then they can get provided sort of their benchmark information. Um, and so one of the things that Juliana would like to do is make this an app-based tool that um, has algorithms that processes that information and sort of spits back more immediately um, information for the, um, for the veterinarian. And so all of that is, you know, some of it's a pipe dream and some of it's in the works and we're trying to apply for funding. And so what we need is people that are just as excited about this as we are to help support these efforts and, um, and help get on board. So how can you contribute? Well, one thing that you can do is to um, use the QR code to take our survey um, and, and pass it around to anybody that you know, because the more data that we can get, the better that we can um, develop our system. Um, you can also advocate in, in practices that use electronic health record um, software systems, you can advocate that those systems become compliant with a system like CAVSNET. And then lastly, you can let us know what stewardship resources might be useful for you in your practice. Because, you know, we have lots of imaginations of things that might be useful, but um, it's the people that are going to utilize them that are on the front lines, you know, um, that we really need help from. And so we need to all partner in this together so we can affect change. So um, just to lastly point out some resources for you, the AVMA has their core um, principles of stewardship, so check out the website for that. Amanda already um, pointed you to our Minnesota One Health Antibiotic Stewardship Collaborative website. The International Society for Companion Animal Infectious Diseases, um, or ISCADE, has created um, thus far three guidelines for antimicrobial prescribing for respiratory diseases in dogs and cats, urinary tract diseases in dogs and cats, so specifically infections, and then um, for uh, secondary pyoderma in dogs. And then, uh, of course, the SAVSNET website, and then Coming to a website in the future, <laughs> uh, CavsNet website, and we, we obviously need to work on our logo, <laughs> so that's a placeholder. Um, and then I'll just last leave you with my email address, so if anyone has questions um, or wants to jump on board, please email me. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Jen. Okay, everyone, I know if you want to, you need to sort of stand up and do a little, you know. But good thing, good news is that um, because all my previous colleagues gave a wonderful, amazing presentation, I can really cut on some of what I have to say to you uh, and hopefully will not take too much of your time and we can go into, have hopefully some time if you can stick around for questions and discussions. Uh, but my name is Juliana Rosante and I work for RTI International. It's a research nonprofit. We are based in North Carolina, but I particularly uh, work out of uh, San Diego in my home office, very comfortable. Um, so Amanda showed that, and it, again, just a reminder of the, the, the huge burden of antimicrobial resistance that, that faces us. Um, this is just another version, and believe me, it's very hard. I think it's becoming more common now to see those potential routes of transmissions of AMR, including uh, companion animals. Jan photoshopped her dog, which I think was great. Hi, Alan. Actually, forgot to say hi to Alan. <laughs> uh, so do you need to, to stretch too, Alan? You can do that. <laughs> okay. uh, so, uh, but it's difficult, you know, and, and in also this, this uh, picture here, again, speaks to the complexity, and Amanda mentioned complexity and comprehensive approach and one health approach that is needed in this situation. Um, it's very hard for us to identify attribute responsibilities or who is responsible for what, to what extent, and how we can actually interview in an efficient way to control this um, very serious problem without data. 
right? So without information. So we need to collect information on news, on resistance, on all those different segments so we can actually be able to identify potential areas for introduction, uh, uh, developing our interventions, and as well as monitor how we are doing, right? Because once you put an intervention in place, you want to make sure is what is this doing? Is it doing what it's supposed to do or not? And again, the whole data surveillance informatics it speaks to this monitoring and keeping track of things. So uh, I just want to give you, uh, and, and again, also Amanda mentioned NARMS, which is the National Antimicrobial Resistance Monitoring System. And that's um, out of three uh, federal, I don't know why my, my no, it's not you. It's I. There's some default to to my PowerPoint. Anyway, oh. so bear with me. Sorry, is gonna try to move ahead. He uh, probably knows that you, it's late and you guys need to go, and I should go fast. So, um, but anyway, uh, the point here of of and that's the reason why I want to talk a little bit about NARMS is because that is a program that integrates data from human, food animals, and retail meat, and the last report, it's, it, it works on several pathogens, not all of them on those, on those uh, food, re meat, and, and, and humans. Um, but for example, Salmonella is one of the pathogens that goes across the board. So you can actually see the, how they relate to each other in this, in this program. One thing that is missing in arms, as, you, as we are discussing here, is companion animal data. But what is going to happen is that both FDA, CDC, and USDA, FSIS, those are the three agencies involved in NARMS, uh, they have already realized that how that is a big gap. The fact that you don't have companion animals in this um, uh, anti national antimicrobial surveillance system. And I can tell you that it, it's, it's on the works to include um, companion animals part as NARMS. I was told that uh, the next report that was published, you will see data on companion animals that has been collected. We will see. Uh, unfortunately, those tends to be a little slow. The last report that is available online is from 2015, so it's really not real-time data. Uh, but in any event, I think there is that movement to to integrate and be broader and actually encompass um, companion animals um, as part of NARS as well. Another effort uh, in, in, um, in, in veterinary medicine is VetLearn. And VetLearn is um, a network of lab laboratories. And I know UCOM is part of VetLearn, uh, so is Minnesota. There are 45 laboratories across the nation, and one actually, uh, uh, the University of Guelph, is also part of the VetLearn. And this is um, based on FDA uh, Centers for Veterinary Medicine, and um, they are, uh, they have been mainly, they started mainly to respond to the melamine crisis and uh, monitor emergencies in veterinary medicine. Um, but they are becoming more involved also in antimicrobial resistance and um, being uh, and in companion animals. Um, to the point that they have done a couple of studies, and this one in particular has been published, um, where they conducted a pilot with about 20 uh, veterinary uh, diagnostic laboratories looking at the prevalence and the antimicrobial susceptibility for E. coli, staph, pseudo-intermediates, and salmonella. Uh, the caveat here, the interesting thing is that salmonella end up uh, uh, covering all sorts of hosts and not just uh, companion animals. Uh, but they look at whole genome sequence, they, they, they sequence about, they got about 2,000 isolates and about 200 of those were sequenced and have information on what they predict to be susceptibility. And this is the paper. Uh, it's just fresh out of the oven, so to speak, and, and reports what they found. Um, and again, this is sort of a, maybe this, uh, and my, my point with this is this, this movement towards uh, incorporating 
uh, companion animal data into uh, federal efforts of looking at the more comprehensive approach of antimicrobial resistance. I, I think that's the point I, I want to make here. Of course, we have out of FDA, Center for Veterinary, Veterinary Medicine, their goals for, for the next five years as far as fighting antimicrobial resistance. And I can tell you they have three goals. And two of those goals talk about companion animals. Okay, this goal number uh, 1.2, it has three action plans, and they are all about companion animals. More specifically here, you know, it's talking about development and implementation strategy to promote, to promote antimicrobial stewardship in companion animals. Uh, under the third goal, it's also talking about increase the domestic capacity to monitor antimicrobial resistance in animal and zoonotic pathogens to include companion animals and animal feed. So again, uh, slowly, I think that's why it's great that we are all here in this room now and we have all those amazing speakers because it, 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 it seems, and I, I really believe that there is a momentum now for us to be able to, to actually make an effort and be proactive in addressing this because um, efforts are going, this slow data collection, at least at the federal level, for certain pathogens are slowly starting. And I think by us being in the forefront in, in being proactive in leveraging the data sets that now we, we, we have would contribute to generate, to be ahead of anything that will come. Um, so, uh, but the, the other thing that I would like to point it out is that um, those efforts at the federal level, they will likely not generate any information that you in your practice could rapidly implement. You are not going to be, that information that would come out of that would not really be related to your, your needs or for you to implement the stewardship efforts that not necessarily would generate the information that you need to guide your practices. So um, again, what we are discussing here, collecting data on news uh, and, and, and creating the surveillance um, system for companion animals is critical because that type of data will be able to give you the information you need to make changes at your at your practice at the local level. So uh, with that idea in mind, we in San Diego, um, or me in San Diego, because <laughs> it's just me there, um, uh, but us at RTI um, started a, a, a pilot project and that is a very um, initial uh, first steps on our pilot. Uh, but we partner with a private veterinary diagnostic uh, laboratory. Uh, they receive uh, samples from 100, uh, about 130 veterinary clinics in the area. Of course, those are animals that are sick. You know, those are probably animals that are, have failed multiple treatments. We don't have the history, but that's the data that it's available, right? And we need to be aware of their limitations, but it, very important for us to look, how, how does that look like? What is that data showing, showing us as far as trends, as far as resistance patterns, right? So we have data, microbiological data and susceptibility tests for about six years of data for this one veterinary diagnostic lab in San Diego. A range of samples, and I could tell you, because I was working with this data set, it's complicated, you know, and, and the way that it was being formatted and the way the samples are entered, not all the time you get the very specific description of the sample. But, you know, it's, it's again, uh, issues to be working as we move forward. Um, we, uh, this, this data set included multiple species, but we focus on mainly our analysis on dogs and cats because they were primarily actually the, the, the animals that were uh, included in the data set. We just did a descriptive statistics to characterize the data set. And we, there was about 160 organisms that had been isolated. So it was just impossible for us to just 
look at susceptibility for all of those. We were just going to go crazy. Um, but we uh, chose uh, to look at um, interpret the susceptibility for E. coli, uh, staph pseudo-intermediates, pseudomonas, um, and also proteus mirabilis. Um, to, to basically take a look and see exactly what their resistant patterns were, what we were seeing. Um, the data we got um, contained what is the interpretation of the results, so resistance, susceptible, intermediate, but we decided to focus on, but it also contained uh, the minimum inhibitory concentration, the MICs for, for those tests, and we decided to uh, interpret, reinterpret, reinterpret the MICs rather than just take the resistance susceptible or, or intermediate. But that's, that's an option as well because in the end of the day, that's the result being provided back to the practitioner, right? But that's what's the, what we did. We look at uh, the MICs and we use veterinary breakpoints from uh, CLSI, a, standard, a, a, a group that sets the standards for for um, antimicrobial susceptibility interpretation. And we use those to uh, generate our um, measurements of resistance. So um, I, I, we haven't yet finished all the, the analysis, but I would like to share with you some of the results that we obtained for dog urine, E. coli dog urine, and um, but, but that is the slide of that. But, um, but anyway, um, we got, uh, urine was the most common. And I, and I think, again, maybe it's not that surprising uh, that you would see urine samples being one of the most common ones submitted to, to, to a, um, a veterinary diagnostic lab. There was about uh, 17,000 isolates during those six years. And 87% were from dogs, 13 for cats. We didn't see any Campylobacter, and we saw uh, about uh, 21 uh, non-typhoto Salmonellas, and five or 15 from dogs and 16 from cats. Unfortunately, none of those Salmonellas have been, uh, we don't know their serotypes, um, and I in particular, I, I have a bias with Salmonella. I really, really like Salmonella. So I, <laughs> I was just really curious about what, what they were, but we don't have that information. But, but here's just the top 10 pathogens uh, that we see, and you can, you can take a look, you can see how E. coli and pseudo staph pseudo-intermediates are really on the top. Um, not so much for cats, of course, uh, but, but we ranked by both of the two species aggregated and then and separately <laughs> here. And, and those that are highlighted there, those are the organs, organisms that we selected to further look at susceptibility. Uh, Enterococcus was a big um, group, was the third um, organisms that we isolated. However, um, it's just we didn't have much, very good information on a species, and therefore we decided not to uh, dive into that uh, particular organisms because we would be interested in having maybe some species there. Same thing with beta streptococcus. Again, we can we can have a whole entire um, conference to just discuss the standardization and methods and diagnostic methods and all of that because those are some of the outputs that we have to kind of dance around. Um, but in any event, uh, those four organisms were the ones we selected for susceptibility. But as I was mentioning to you, the results I just wanted to present today is um, just for dog urine, E. coli isolated from dog urine. And, and um, there were about 2,000 uh, isolates from E. coli in dog urine, and uh, that constitute actually 68% of all E. coli um, in, in dogs from the, from the data set that we obtained. Uh, about 29% of, of those uh, isolates were resistance to at least one um, antimicrobial class, okay? 
Uh, and out of those resistance, so out of those 500, almost 600, uh, about pretty much all of them were resistance to, almost all of them were resistance to ampicillin. Um, and, um, and, and most, the, the uh, about, so there was 583 isolates uh, that were resistance to ampicillin, and 183 of those were only resistance to ampicillin. The other ones were in association with other, um, they had other co-detections, especially uh, the clavamox. Um, uh, very interesting uh, is the 36% uh, of the resistance strains um, had co-resistance to multiple drugs. Um, Well, we wanted to provide as well because there is, uh, because the breakpoints, and, and, and that's one thing that I want to mention. To tell about percentage resistance, we need to have a breakpoint to interpret that. And they are either a veterinary breakpoint or they are a human breakpoint. And, uh, but of course, we use way more drugs than the ones that have veterinary breakpoints available. So we wanted to provide a distribution of the MICs. So each individual could understand how, how the resistance is distributed for all the drugs that actually the laboratory tests. So that's just a very overwhelming, gigantic, awful table. Uh, but that's the, the idea is to convey um, that distribution of the MICs. And uh, not to go too much into the weeds, but again, pointing some of the challenges you can see here. This is a reflect of how the data is reported and the limit of detection of the method used for the different drugs. And at this point, I, I'm not comfortable in aggregating those at this point and making assumptions. So I decided to report the data as it is. But you have uh, MIC of eight, and also you, you see for certain drugs that the MIC is reported as you know, less than eight. And what is less than eight? Less than eight is two, less than eight or four. And sometimes that affects the breakpoint, especially. Anyway, again, another conference totally dedicated to that, but it's a <laughs> challenge. <laughs> and, um, and, and again, just a, 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 some borderlines, again, of issues, the methods that get updated. Um, the MIC gets updated, but the test doesn't get updated. And, and then you have that lag time between. Um, Nonetheless, uh, there is value to looking into this, um, to, the, to this data. This is just another way of seeing over time, um, we really weren't able to find any necessarily uh, trend here, to be honest with you, but it shows the proportions about res of those equalizing dog urine that were uh, resistance to one class, two classes, three classes, four classes. Right, and you can see that um, uh, the resistance to four classes of antimicrobials are X for unequalizing dog urine actually is pretty common compared to, to the other ones. Um, we also took a stab here, and this is very premature, but uh, we wanted to be able to folks to access that information because all what a practitioner receives is the result Res resistance susceptible and so on and so forth for that one particular isolate that was submitted. And we wanted to, and this was before I met anyone <laughs> of, those, of those folks here, um, we wanted to be able to develop this dashboard where a practitioner could go and could select, you know, dog urine and be able to look at what actually it's around them and again basically it would be this regional um, regional um, antibiogram so we we this is a very initial prototype I cannot even share or it's not even functional but that was the idea that we started in again and try to make that information accessible to practitioners in the area and hopefully we will be able to take that to the next level um, but again, it, it's just you, you submit, you, you just choose your, 
um, drug and you see th that um, pattern of resistance and, and how that uh, relates. The, the, of course, I think, uh, again, the, the goal here is this idea of by having access to data that is, you know, instead of you just receiving that one uh, susceptibility test, you have access to a pool of data that can help inform, inform your decision. So, um, my, my final conclusions here, and I promised you it was going to be quick, and, uh, but so um, was uh, that, again, this, we need this comprehensive approach to fight um, antimicrobial resistance. And, and, and we need to be driven by evidence, and that means driven by data and the information that we collect, we, we should be looking into evaluating so we can then um, improve our, the way we, we, we do things. Um, antimicrobial and susceptibility test results um, from veterinary diagnostic labs, they can generate very helpful information. And, and again, we heard about those before. Um, you know, they can, you can help with developing those regional and facility antibiograms. And those are things that are available in localized spots and sometimes different institutions make them available to their, to their clients. But what about making this a, a real-time, customizable way that you can actually have that on the tip of your fingers to make a decision when you need it, right? Uh, again, we, we talk about monitoring trends of antimicrobial resistance. We talked about looking at new emerging issues because this data that we receive, again, is not just about susceptibility, it's also about what kind of pathogens we are seeing in the area. Again, of course, uh, animals that are sick, right? But they might be able to, to, to show um, patterns and inf important information for us. Another thing that I wanted to add here that I think that this data is also very powerful and I touch into is this, those breakpoints. Those breakpoints, for you to be able to identify resistance, you need breakpoints and there are very few for veterinary medicine. When you look at this powerful data, when you look at that uh, experts, uh, CLSI experts, they can revise and develop new breakpoints for new drugs. And I think that's also another thing that will help with the veterinary um, practice is, is by having new breakpoints. Um, and of course, uh, by, by looking at those, those big types of data, you are looking at a range of, of organisms that you otherwise wouldn't have access to. And all of that information are critical for any stewardship effort as we heard, and I don't need to. I think it's very clear to all of you. Uh, I just wanted to point out some limitations here because, you know, as a scientist, we always to be like, yeah, but, <laughs> but um, uh, th this is just, um, <clears throat> I think, going forward, you know, looking at methods and uh, I mentioned the breakpoints before and the fact that, again, this data is not reflective for being very aware that this data is not reflective of the population as a whole and so on and so forth. Uh, but again, as Jen mentioned, I think this is also uh, by looking at a data overall, you start hypothesis, hypothesis generating and you can have more target questions that you can then go after. So um, yeah, and that's it, I think. Um, Hope I keep my promise of being Thank quick. Thank you very much. <laughs> oh boy, what a night. Okay, well, I feel like I was back in school. Boy, my head is killing me now. <laughs> Whew, that's a lot of information, right? Whew. Does anybody have any questions? Does everybody here see that there is an answer to this, that this, this silo thing is a problem, that without sharing this information, without collecting it, um, this is just going to keep going on and we're going to keep flying blind is an old expression that I've seen around which it says you cannot manage what you do not measure right that in a nutshell is what this is all about you can't manage what you do not measure so I think the time is now I would ask Connecticut practitioners to get on board with this to partner with the diagnostic lab at UConn 
with the practitioners in Minnesota and start taking some of that wonderful information, funneling into a place where it's actually useful for the very first time, rather being siloed as it has been for decades and decades and decades, um, I would say that that's our job here. I'm gonna take this film, because we've recorded every segment of it, and I think what I'll do is divide it up in chapters because it's, it's a lot. It's a lot for, for anybody to take in. But I could do it in chapters, and the truth of the matter is, is this will be all over YouTube, and you start getting the message out. You keep pumping the message, you know? This is necessary and the time is now, and it's that simple. It's that simple, and pet owners are going to be key in this. And the reason being is, we talk about the veterinary uh, profession as a whole. It's like a big ship, it's like an aircraft carrier, right? It's huge, it's complex, it's fine-tuned, it's you know automated, it's all these things. But the truth of the matter is, is that we are the ocean that float that boat. We pet owners are the ocean that floats that boat. And so don't think for a second that we don't have power and have influence over the fact that this is something that pet owners want, they desire, and you know what, and so do the veterinarians because that's why they're in the job in the first place. So I guess in conclusion, I'd say thank, thank you for coming everybody and let's just, let's just do this. How's that? All right, great, let's do it.